everybody, and welcome to the Monshire Museum of Science. My name is Marco Staffney. I'm the executive director for the museum, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this conversation called Steps to Sustainability, a Path to Renewable Energy. So with me this evening, we have Morton Bailey from Lion Green Heat, Maura Adams from Northern Forest Center, Sam Lincoln, the Deputy Commissioner from the Vermont Department of Forests, Parks and Recreation, and Andrew Perlchik from Clean Energy Fund of Vermont. Uh, I'd also like to thank Trish Palau, our Marketing Communications Manager for the Monshire, for helping to put this group together with Maura, so appreciate that. Um, I'll kick off this evening's conversation by talking a little bit about how the Monshire arrived at the decision to switch our oil boiler to a wood pellet boiler system. Uh, the conversation actually started around 2016 when we were adopting a new strategic plan. Uh, in that plan, we had four major goals for the museum, to maximize opportunities for discovery, to elevate our outdoor experience, to strengthen our core base of operations, and to tell our story in new and exciting ways. Now, as part of strengthening our core base of operations, what we wanted to accomplish was really understanding our environmental impact and our building to make sure that it was running as efficiently as possible. And with a goal of by 2020, really being able to make sure that the Montshire was operating with a smaller carbon footprint. So once that plan got adopted, what we decided to do was work with Efficiency Vermont to find a partner to help us create that efficiency audit. So we worked with an organization called Zero by Degrees that helped to take a look at our entire facility and our plant and make make sure that we were running as efficiently as possible before making any energy selections or choices. So the two things, or the two major initial recommendations that they came up with was to change out our building's environmental control system, which helps to operate the flow of air throughout our entire building. That was the first major step. But then also to change out an older oil boiler, boiler with a wood pellet boiler system, which that was new information to us. We had never thought about doing that. The museum actually has two boilers, or had two boiler systems. The building, which is original to 1989, had an older boiler system, and then a newer boiler system, that both using oil, was installed around the 2001 when the building expanded. So on our plan, we had decided that we were going to change out the original oil boiler in about a year or so. So it was no surprise that we were going to need to change something out to be, become more efficient, but we had not considered wood as a selection. So with Zero by Degrees, uh, their recommendation was that we work with Lime Green Heat to change out our current older boiler with a wood pellet boiler. And that's where I'll let uh, Morton Bailey take it from there to talk a little bit about on the ground of what was it like to switch out this boiler and why was that a good decision for the Montshire? Sure. <clears throat> um, so uh, when we originally came into the building um, with zero by degrees, uh, we, we did an initial analysis uh, looking at the building and saying, does the system actually fit into the building? Um, does the equipment fit? Is there a place to store the wood pellets? Uh, wood pellets are stored differently than oil, so you need a larger volume of storage um, and need a place to put that uh, uh, to significantly handle the heat load of the building, having a proper volume of fuel. Um, so we came in, uh, looked in, uh, in the building at the two different boiler systems, uh, one which is located in the basement and the other one which is located located in uh, on the first floor of the building um, after that initial site visit uh, we, we determined that there was adequate space in the basement uh, for two pellet boilers to be installed um, that would handle uh, about 90% of the building load uh, heating load um, so as part of that we decided that uh, the best uh, scenario would be to install the two pellet boilers in the basement and then tie the uh, the piping system the hot water uh, supply and return from the basement up to the uh, existing oil boiler in the addition of the building um, that way we could uh, send energy from the pellet boilers up to the uh, heating system in the addition and send uh, energy back down into the basement system uh, from the existing oil boiler if the load became too much for the pellet boilers. Um, so it, it really just came down to um, coming up with a good strategy to do that finding a place to put the equipment. Um, the Monshire's uh, overall HVAC system is uh, somewhat 
um, uh, somewhat cramped. Uh, everything in the building is in the basement uh, for, for HVAC equipment. Uh, there's no rooftop uh, ventilation units and that type of, of equipment um, outside of the building. Uh, so the space is, is fairly limited, um, but we were able to come up with some good solutions and uh, uh, everything integrated in pretty well. Yeah, we should say that the Monshire is a 30,000 square foot interior facility, so it's a bit different than heating a home. So right. um, maybe some more, or someone would like to talk a little bit about sort of how these types of systems are being used um, throughout New England, throughout the United States, and why, why this is a good option for heating now. Sure, I can, I can start with that. Um, sure. This technology, um, automated wood heating, really started in um, Austria, in Upper Austria, and it's become very common in much of Europe. It's a totally mainstream choice, and yet, in the U.S., you tell people that you, you're working on a program to support wood pellet boilers, and they say, oh, I have a wood pellet stove. There's not um, any significant public awareness that you can heat with wood pellets just like you would with an oil or propane boiler that you can have the system in your basement you get bulk delivered pellets they feed automatically to the boiler and the heat goes around your house as you want as you touch the thermostat um, so we need really good examples of these systems at every scale so we have many many households heating this way now and a lot of really great institutions like the Mottshire making this decision because they know that it's good for the local economy to be buying local renewable heat they know that it's good for the environment you're cutting your carbon emissions by over 50 percent from day one um, you're helping support the forest economy that Sam can certainly talk about more but um, we need more people making the choice and setting a good example and telling people about it, which why, is why we're so glad that you're having this event tonight and willing to spread the word. Great. Well, maybe you'd like to talk a little bit more about what is happening in the state of Vermont. Uh, currently in, in the Northeast, uh, there's a, a, a market crisis. Uh, the, the low-grade wood that's been harvested throughout the region is 75% uh, of the harvest in Vermont is what we call low-grade wood, which is pulp wood made into paper, um, biomass that's burned to generate electricity, and a lot of that pulp wood was shipped to Maine, and Maine's paper industry was based heavily on newsprint, magazine paper, catalogs, and in a very short amount of time, about 26 or 28 months, uh, Maine has lost 40% of their capacity to uh, uh, process, market that wood as paper due to uh, uh, society moving toward being paperless, toward uh, uh, overseas production where the U.S. dollar is strong and can buy more paper from a, a country with an emerging economy that's investing in newer, more efficient, high production mills. Um, and uh, also fossil fuel prices are so low that wood used for energy is pellets, biomass, uh, firewood, uh, chips that are used to heat institutional buildings are all facing uh, competition against that. Um, when we talk about 40% market loss in Maine, um, it's about four and a half million tons. And, and to put that number into perspective that people can understand, it's about 140,000 tractor trailer loads a year of forest products in this region that have lost the market annually. And um, a, a fair portion of that was originating out of Vermont's forests. So to sustainably manage forests is like weeding, growing a garden. We, uh, you know, I have a dairy farming, crop farming background, and, and, and the, and the um, picture is easily painted as growing, you, you, don't, you never grow a healthy garden, you never grow healthy crops without pulling weeds and um, promoting the crops that you want to succeed and grow into a viable, uh, make fruit. And um, the same theory applies in the forest management, to, and maybe that's oversimplifying it, but you're weeding the forest and getting paid for the weeds. And um, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's about 75% of the annual harvest in Vermont is what we call low grade. And um, so finding new markets for that is a major priority for this uh, Scott, the Scott administration right now. And has, um, how are products like these large scale wood pellet boilers playing into the, the economy in this way? Well, uh, pellet heat is an uh, um, automated, efficient system, uh, a, a great way to burn, to, to utilize wood for energy. I myself, as a, even as a logging contractor in my private sector life, invested in an automated wood boiler uh, as a, a, a clearly the way of the future. Um, 
but one of the things that we're facing is that pellet plants um, are, are, having a, are struggling to be profitable. We're, we're having an influx of pellets from outside the country, outside the region, where the scale is bigger, the cost of doing business is lower. So part of my directive uh, when I was, was appointed to this job was to look at the cost of doing business for product, businesses that process forest products in Vermont and address that to make that, can we close that loop, can we make it closer, uh, process it closer to home. We still have uh, half of our harvest uh, is going to cordwood and firewood in Vermont and that's a major market still. And, 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 uh, Burning it in newer, more efficient, cleaner burning stoves is important. A third of our school children in Vermont are heated by wood chips. Um, but again, as this forest um, economy is reshaping throughout the Northeast, we're seeing trucks where we used to deliver our excess wood, we used to export to Maine, we're now seeing wood starting to flow back into Vermont from outside the state. Where, where they see what we've done here, what we've built here as market opportunity, where they didn't, they used to have that market close to their home. So um, we're trying to address policies that make it competitive to market low grade forest products in Vermont and keep the businesses sustainable uh, and economically viable here um, because of all the things that, good, that are enabled by uh, sustainable forest management, harvesting low grade products. So the, the Northern Forest Center works across the northern forest of New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. And um, Vermont has done a really exceptional job promoting the wood pellet and wood chip industry. They see real um, economic and environmental importance in this. And Andy's um, uh, agency, are you an agency? Department. You're a department. You can be your own agency. <laughs> um, Andy's department has, has done a really good job investing in the, both the supply and demand side. So this might be a good chance yeah, for you to tell Yeah, and I wanted to say with there. economic development, an important thing that we like to emphasize is that when you're buying a wood product, 90% or 90 cents on the dollar is going to stay locally. It's going to go to the, to the logger and that whole chain. But if you're buying oil, yeah, the fuel dealer is going to get some of that, but 80 cents of that dollar is going to go out of the state. So the state as a whole is really looking at wood heat <coughs> from many different perspectives as good for the state. It's good for the forestry reasons. It's good for the economic development through many different sectors. And it's good for our energy plan. You know, we have a, a plan to get more and more renewable energy. We're doing a really good job with electricity. And we've done, like the museum, that focused first on efficiency. The state created an efficiency utility. We did a lot of work on that for the last 17 years or whatever it's been. Now we're trying to focus on other sectors. Transportation and heating is a big thing where it's almost all fossil fuels or our electric portfolio is getting cleaner and cleaner. So we're, we as the energy office have a goal of getting to 35% of our energy from renewable energy, which is mainly wood. Uh, there could be some other small things, but since we're in a, a state that's 80% forested or something like that? 78. 78%. <laughs> it's a great resource that we could use, and there's a way to do so, burning it cleanly and inefficiently and keeping all those economic dollars. So we work with the forest, par forest and parks. We work with economic development. We work with air quality on these emissions issues and carbon issues. And we think more than other states that I'm aware of, have a good team of all the different state entities agreeing that this is the good way to go forward. And Scott administration has been really uh, supportive and leaders on this as well. And so I think we have everything in place except, as what Moore said, not a lot of knowledge. People don't know about it. Kind of like the museum said when somebody suggested it, you were like, well, what is that? <laughs> People don't know about it. So that's something that I know that Moore's working on and that we're working on as well. We do provide incentives both for residential systems. You know, we provide an incentive uh, through our program for this, for the, for the museum to be able to, to bring the cost down because the upfront cost is, is quite high for these systems. And so we're trying to find ways to bring down those costs and make it, make the entry into this, what might, people might think of as an alternative or exotic fuel, even though it's all around us, and to make that a little easier. And that's what we're trying to do. So we've been talking about the market as a whole, which means that there's a lot of different types of wood and lots of different wood systems. And I'd love for someone to explain the difference in biomass fuels, because we have a 
pallet uh, system, which is what I think when you're saying about education, people mm -hmm. not necessarily understanding the difference between what is a large scale biomass you know, plant when we talk about large wood product or we talk about pallet product down to your home installation of, you know, at one point I had a wood pellet stove mm -hmm. in my house, which is not quite the same thing as a, yeah. well, at all, as a, a wood pellet boiler. So would someone sort of share the sort of different types of biomass that's out there right now? Sure. So go ahead. <laughs> go ahead so, so the people often use the word biomass to talk about biomass power plants. Mm -hmm. Like um, Burlington Electric is fired by wood chips. So that's providing electricity. It's a lot less efficient than using wood for heat. So a lot of us working on wood heat like to make a distinction because um, there's a lot of controversy around wood electric. It's really important to have that market for low grade wood, but um, there is a really important differentiation based on the efficiency level when you're using wood for heat instead. So we've gotten away from just using the word biomass, which is, doesn't even necessarily refer to wood, and talking about like you said, wood chips are what are typically um, used in larger installations. So it would still be an automated or a semi-automated system, um, but heating a lot of Vermont schools, for example. Um, then there's semi-dried chips, which are kind of new, and there's some hybrid um, boilers that can take either semi-dry chips or pellets um, that have a lot of potential. Um, but pellets are probably the most common, or they're they're used more on a smaller scale, so there would be more individual installations. Um, it's 100% wood. There, it's compressed very, very, very tightly. Um, so there's a lot of BTUs, a lot of heat in this very small package. And um, a lot of people are familiar with using pellets in bags. So you'd have a pellet stove and you would dump the bag, 40 pound bag into the stove and have to clean it every few days, which is great. Um, it's a nice option for a lot of in a lot of cases, but eventually people might not want to be hauling 40 pound bags of pellets anymore, or might not want to have to cl clean a stove. Um, people, of course, know about cordwood, and and that's certainly the most familiar um, way of heating with wood. But then, the automated systems really take the person out of it, so you can leave it for weeks on end and not have to do anything. All you have to do is take a little bit of ash out, and Mort can talk better than I can about the, the technology. But um, it really, w one thing we really like about it and we see a lot of people appreciating is that it allows you to keep heating with wood um, and support the local economy in that way and cut your carbon emissions without having to deal with the inconvenience of hauling wood or dumping bags of pellets or any of that. So we've, my organization has provided a lot of incentives and other support um, for installations around the region. And one thing we hear quite a bit is, we have people who were heating with cordwood and are getting older and don't want to haul cordwood anymore and make this switch and feel really positive about that transition because they can still heat with local wood this way. That's great. Or, I mean, from, sure. from silo to hot air, could you just sort of give us an explanation of how a pellet system actually works? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, kind of starting out at fuel delivery. Um, so you're going to have a truck uh, to show up here at the museum, um, back up to the silo, hook up a hose just like an oil delivery truck or a propane truck would how deliver that, that fuel. How big is that silo? Um, that silo is 18 tons, um, and so 18 tons of capacity. Um, so that is equivalent to about 2,000 gallons of number two heating oil. Um, so the, the truck is going to show up, uh, hook up a hose, and actually use air to blow the pellets into the silo. Um, from there, uh, the boiler is going to use a vacuum system to draw the pellets through uh, a pair of two-inch vacuum lines uh, that enter uh, here at the museum. Uh, they travel um, about 80 feet from the silo to the boilers. Um, so there's no, there's no interaction uh, for the, the end user with the fuel. Um, it's just like an oil or a gas uh, delivery. Um, one of the great, the great properties of a wood pellet is uh, the small diameter and uh, the, the short length. And that allows it to be conveyed like a liquid. Um, so that's why uh, pellets are kind of considered the, um, the most, the, the, 
the biomass fuel that's going to be able to affect the most uh, homes and businesses in New England because it's easily conveyed. Um, if you had a chip system, you'd be into large augers and uh, difficult ways of moving that fuel. Um, it wouldn't work in a building like the Monshire. So the ability to have that fuel move like a liquid um, is very important. Um, once the, the pellets are drawn from the silo over to the boiler, um, it's a, a fairly simple burner system uh, where the pellets uh, drop down uh, into the burner are stoked up onto um, uh, basically a burner plate where primary air is injected and uh, is burned at about 1400 degrees. Um, so we have uh, you know, basically no smoke going out the chimney, so it's an extremely clean burn, uh, very low ash uh, traveling out of the boiler. Uh, what ash is being created, um, which is very low, uh, the pellets that, that you're going to be using here at the museum have less than 1% ash. Uh, per pound. So the ash content's very low. Um, so the boiler has an ash removal system that will compact that and uh, has to be emptied out, um, you know, after four tons of pellets are burned through the boiler. Um, so during the winter months, every, you know, three weeks or so, um, facility staff will have to go down and take about five minutes to empty out the ash box. Um, and it will send them an email to tell them when the ash box is full. Um, so it's really is, is, you know, close to heating with oil or gas as you can get um, while using, you know, a product that was, you know, literally produced within, you know, 50 to 100 miles of the museum. Or even better, my oil tank doesn't send me an email when it's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small gauge on mine, right? right? So, uh, Andrew, could you tell us a little bit about how people might find out about incentives or things that, or find out how if this is the right choice for them? Yeah, well, Mar is going to have a website, right? So you, they can talk about that. But from our, from the state perspective of the incentives, there we have a contractor that does the kind of day-to-day -day administration of that program. They're called the Renewable Energy Resource Center, and that's kind of the easiest to find on the internet. You know, our state website is like 40 characters long, uh, but if they just search for the Clean Energy Development Fund or you know Vermont incentives for pellet heating or thing like that, they would they would find either our website or the RERC website, and they could call us and we would talk to them. I mean, at this point, it's still pretty small numbers. When we were doing solar incentives, we were doing 4,000 incentives a year almost. You know, we were doing a lot. Uh, we're still only doing maybe 50 pellet boilers a year. So it's it's still possible for us to talk to every customer <laughs> and, talk and explain it and go over it with them. And, help them if they have to. if they're a bigger outfit that needs to do a bidding prospect we'll work with them on that and give them the list of, of the dealers and, and installers and things like that so we still do a lot of hand holding and, and talking and explaining and we also allow people a lot longer time because often like today i talked to a church in montpelier that wants to switch to pellets but they just have a committee and they're just now learning about it and then they're going to have a meeting in a two months. And then after that, they're going to have a whole congregation meeting. And so they said maybe in May they would be able to get the congregation on board. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully we'll still have incentives by then. But it, it takes a long time. So for some entities like churches and schools or towns that have to go in front of voters to bond or just to get approval, we allow some more time and, and really work with them. Because we understand that's kind of what's needed. That's where the market is right now. And I would say from the Monshire's perspective that this process was not something that we were enlightened on in January and then made the, deci the decision to switch in February. Right. It's about a seven month process of deliberation and going back and forth. We actually had, I think, five different engineering checks on making sure that this particular system was the right fit for the museum, um, both through engineering and through uh, mathematical statistics and looking at is this the right price point. So it wasn't an arbitrary decision. Yeah. I don't think anyone should. Um, just like walk into a decision like this, especially when you're looking to heat such a large facility over time. But I think it, it, in all of those checks, everything has come out uh, correct. And we just turned on the heater um, in October or so. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, I think that's kind of what happens when, like if your boiler two years ago would have broke and you just needed heat, mm -hmm. you would have called a somebody and they would have come down like oh we'll put in new oil boilers here's the price you might would have spent some time on the price or get a bid but you wouldn't have thought about it because it's just not out there and there's not many if you just call your regular plumber they're likely they won't know about it 
and they're not going to even suggest about it. So that's that's, that's a lot. There's of a work. lot of work to do in that sphere in getting traditional HVAC technicians and companies to know that this exists and be trained in it and have the confidence to recommend it to their customers. But there are some companies doing that. One of yeah. them um, got an award last week at the Energy Action Network's um, uh, summit they held around climate change in Vermont. And they the owner stood up and said, I think this is the first time that a climate change conference has ever clapped for a fossil fuel <laughs> company. And it's true, but they're diversifying because they see this as a really important way to um, diversify what they offer and continue helping Vermont. One of the things in the department uh, recently hired a, a um, wood coordinator, wood, uh, this position that we just filled, because of the, to help uh, so along right. with these conversations. Because uh, some of us, you know, some of us grew up with wood heat. We understood it. We saw the the evolution to automation, but there are lots of folks who are not exposed to that. So we're trying to provide that uh, staff person's uh, time to do that outreach. A lot of a lot of different agencies and departments supported that position and and our and our supporting that uh, role to help people realize that this is an option and how to make it how to make that choice correctly so they so they succeed with it. What, what would each of your vision be for wood in the future for the state or for New England? Well, we, we have a goal of getting to 35% for the state of heat. And I think what we're trying to focus on is bigger buildings like the Monshire because it also helps the pellet supply market. We have only one operating pellet mill right now in the state. We had two, one, one shut down, hopefully temporarily, hopefully we'll get another one built next year, but there are other ones around us. But we see more opportunities to have that other economic development potential of having these mills actually in the state as well and having kind of local high quality Vermont pellets Nothing against New Hampshire, but <laughs> so that that we can just get the full benefit of, of that. And I think I would like to see all the large buildings. I think any building over 30,000 square feet should be wood heated. If there are residential situations where maybe it isn't the best situation, or maybe a pellet stove is fine and you wouldn't want to go through the expense of a pellet boiler. But there's you know, millions of square feet that we could be heating with, with wood. And there's enough wood from what mm -hmm. our friends in the forest, the, you know, the part of the state that's in charge of protecting our forest are saying we have the ability and the need to use some of this wood. So as long as the forest can supply it, you know, I hope that we can heat as much as we can with it. Yeah, um, so, you know, Lime Green Heat was started as uh, a company to make wood heat for everyone um, and that's what we feel pellet fuel allows us to do um, so you know our goal is to continue to uh, serve residential commercial municipal customers throughout New Hampshire and Vermont in uh, their path towards using you know locally sustainable wood fuel um, I think we, we truly feel that it is uh, the right energy move for us uh, when it comes to thermal demand in New England right now. Um, what that will be in 50 years, we'll all see. But right now, this is uh, uh, our best way to heat our buildings here in New England. So, I want to see clean, highly efficient, state-of-the-art wood heat to be an absolutely mainstream heating choice and to have a whole value chain that is incredibly smooth and polished and um, everyone is getting the best kind of fuel and delivered in the right way and has absolute confidence in the system and that everyone absolutely thinks of this when they're considering how to heat their buildings that it's not even a question and then that they all that lots of them go and do it too <laughs> <laughs> don't just consider it actually do it i think my vision for this uh, uh, would be to have um, an economically viable supply chain in, in the state that that uh, it enables people to make a living uh, supplying these uh, wood energy products and it that also sustains a lot of our our uh, the businesses that are part of our, fa our rural fabric the, the the forest economy businesses the loggers the truckers the foresters um, and it also and it, and it therefore enables uh, people to own and maintain forest land, uh, and aggregate forest land, where uh, we're, we're learning so much about 
sustainable forest management and all the good things that that brings to society, all the societal benefits that come from that. Um, and rather than being dependent on a global market, if we can be dependent on a local market, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great outcome. Great. Well, thank you all so much for all of your expertise up here. And I think now we're going to go take a tour of our wood pellet boiler system down in the basement. Uh, our silo is out on the uh, what, east side of the building here. Okay. Um, so the vacuum lines travel uh, on the outside of the building through the concrete wall uh, and then along this uh, staging all the way over to the boilers. Um, it's a two line system. The pellets come in on one side. Uh, the return air travels back out to the silo. So it creates a closed loop. Um, so all the dust and fines just stay within the system all the time. Um, now how tiny is the, is the pellet? So a wood pellet's a quarter inch in diameter. Okay. And then round? it's round. Yep. Um, and then typically uh, an inch and a half to a quarter inch in length um, is kind of the standard. So think of it kind of looking like rabbit food. Okay. Um, yeah. And so you can see a few of them still, uh, you know, that are in the vacuum line here, those little black dots. Um, so those are a few pellets that stay in the line uh, until the vacuum system comes back on again. That pulls um, them through, right? That pulls them through. So um, then basically, uh, you know, the boiler tied back into the existing piping in the building. Um, so you can kind of see where the, <clears throat> the previous piping was painted orange um, from back when this was actually an exhibit um, that the HVA system, the HVAC system was. Um, so we basically disconnected the old oil boiler, uh, took that out, uh, redid a small section of piping, uh, tied the boilers in, and then um, this red circulator, uh, so that's a high efficiency circulator pump, that is what pumps the heat from here in the basement uh, through about 400 feet of copper pipe up to the second boiler room. Um, and that is where the uh, oil boiler is uh, that will stage in if the pellet boilers can't keep up with the heating load. Um, so as you can see, it's a tight, uh, busy little basement down here. But generally, can this handle the building? So uh, it's sized to handle about, uh, we're, we're estimating about 90% uh, of the heating load with the pellet boilers. Where does the ash come out? So uh, these are the ash uh, compression boxes here. Um, so the, the maintenance uh, for Gary and his staff would be to come down here, take this box off, set it on one of these containers or take it outside and empty it out. Um, so it's as simple as uh, you know a five minute uh, or less job to take care of the ash. Um, you can see a little bit of ash down in the uh, auger system here, um, and it gets compressed up in when uh, this ball valve is open. So that gets closed when I go to take it off. Uh, when it's on the boiler, it's open and the ash can get pushed into the box.